Today we're finishing up Titus chapter 3, but before we go into the text, if you have children, now's the time to release them to Children's Church. Miss Brown's back there, a whole slew of her helpers, and now's the time for our children to go back and, and have their own personal time of God to hear the gospel at their level. Love having the kids. During the handshaking time, the kids come up and wrap around you and hug on you and stuff. That's, and that's good life. That's a good life. We're in Titus chapter 3, looking at for goodness sake. Titus is going to talk to us about some reminders, four reminders in the text of cha Titus chapter 3. And this is what it says, Titus chapter 3, verse 1, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceful and considerate, and always to be gentle towards everyone. Verse 3, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He loved us. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. And this is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trust in God may be careful to devote themselves to our theme here, which is doing good. Right? Doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Verse 9, but, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. What a good word for us in today's political environment. Amen. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. And after that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such a people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. And as soon as I send Artemis and Tychius to you, do your best to come to me. He's, remember, he's talking to Titus and ne Nicopolis because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good. There's that theme again, right? In order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who, who love us in the faith, and grace be with you all. Please join me for prayer in a moment. Father God, as we approach your word and we finish up the book of Titus, this pastoral letter written to the missionary uh, pastor that was temporarily in Crete, Titus, who was put in place to, to establish things, to renovate the church, to get it back on track when they had gone off the rails. Father God, teach us this morning about these reminders, these critical reminders that we see in the text of how to live for good and how to see our world with good eyes. And Father, and how to interact with it for the gospel and for your glory. Father, teach us from your word. Lord, send us your spirit. God, if nothing else is done here today, I pray that your spirit inhabits this place and speaks through your word to our hearts and encourages us and convicts us of things that we need to deal with. And Father, may we leave this place strengthened in the faith through each other and through your word and through your spirit. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, reminders um, are pretty important. They're critical to life. Uh, last night I was reminded when we were doing a little bit of laundry that, you know, when the, the buzzer on the washing machine or the dryer, right, the dryer, when it goes off, it reminds me that I need to, to pull out whatever's in there because it's going to get wrinkled and I'm going to have to wash it twice and do this again if I'm lazy and I don't pay attention to the buzzer, which is the reminder to go take care of the laundry, right? The alarm on my phone reminds me to wake up each morning, right? I was traveling this week, and that's my alarm. I used to have an alarm clock. Who has an alarm clock anymore, right? Everybody's got a, oh, you guys, old school, old school. Come on, everybody's got their phone sitting right there. You got 50,000 different, but beep, 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 whoop, whoop, whoop. You got all these weird things, you know? It wakes you up, right? Reminds you to get up in the morning. The sunset was God's reminder this morning of new mercies and his warmth upon the earth and his blessings to us. The rooster reminds the farmer to get up and get after the day, right? 
And this week I was reminded with my daughter talking to us. Sarah comes to me, the 15-year-old. And when I went and visited Greg and Caleb for a couple hours, had dinner with them, they all said, without talking to each other, I think, Dad, in six and a half weeks, it's Christmas, right? <laughs> Children remind you of those wonderful things. They, the buzzer on my truck reminds me to put on my seatbelt, right? Seatbelts save lives. It's a big deal. Another buzzer reminds me to turn off my lights or when I come out later on, I will have to jump my battery. Reminders matter. My wedding ring reminds me of my vows and who I belong to, which is Kim. My wife's praises remind me of her love and her devotion and her silence when I mess up and she could easily say that she was right or that I told you so reminds me of the same. My dog running to me and wagging his tail incessantly after I've been gone three days reminds me of how precious a loving pet is and how devoted he is to me. And this morning as I try to sit down and eat my bagel sandwich, him sitting at the sliding glass door on the back stoop, giving me the death stare. <laughs> Dad, you haven't given me my bone after breakfast. Reminds me that I need to get up and give him his biscuit, right? Lots of things remind us of things. When I was a kid, the church bells ringing when I was growing up told me that I needed to get to church or I was going to be late. The worship and music and prayer reminded me of God's love and the joy of sharing the love with a, a faith family. The pastor's sermons reminded me of my responsibilities in discipleship, of what the Lord wanted me to do, they still do today, and of God's empowering me to accomplish what I was created to do. And this morning when I was typing this up, the changing of the text by auto text, I wrote down sermons and it changed it to demons. The pastor's demons, right? <laughs> Reminded me that I should carefully read my text of my manuscript, yes, lest you guys get some weird things that come out when I'm preaching, right? All this is to say we all need reminders. And in this text, Paul's reminding Titus as he leaves him at Crete, some things have gone wrong at the church with those Christ followers on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean. And you need to put things back in place. And we've already looked at establishing godly leaders and sound doctrine and a lot of talk about teaching, teaching, teaching. And last week we looked at what he was to remind each group, older men and older women and younger men and younger women, big piece of that was those who have gone before that have wisdom to hand down that wisdom to those of us who are younger. And it was very interesting this week to hear, to see different posts and hear different people talk about how God spoke to them about that. In today's text, God's going to tell us something a little bit different. He's going to remind us of four things that we need to be thinking about. In interacting with the world, this week when I traveled, I went, I went up to Lake City to encourage a pastor that's out there a little bit isolated, that's new to that area, a friend of mine that I've known from seminary. I went down to Carl Springs to, to meet with a management committee over a Christian camp that our youth go to, and then up to Denver to meet with a few officers, leaders of big mega churches about what's our political agenda, so to speak, for the Southern Baptists moving forward for missions and those kinds of things. And in all those discussions, it kept coming out all these different difficult things, right? I'm dealing with this with the world, and I'm dealing with that with the world, and this is a controversy, and that was in the news, and this is going on. And after three days of that, on my truckload back on Friday night, I was literally emotionally exhausted. You ever feel that way? You watch the news and you're emotionally exhausted? There's some big controversies going on within Christianity, and there was a big debate about that, and where do you fall, and what's the Bible say, and all those things, and, and a lot of that really comes down to how we interact with the world, right? How we interact with the world in a way that, that is tactful, that is godly, that doesn't compromise what the scripture says, but at the same time is loving and kind, and for some reason, we just keep stepping in it on that. We just have a hard time with that, and so when I was studying for this passage, I found it very appealing, these reminders that Paul writes to Titus, that we are to be about doing good. That's the big question, or the big thing here. How do we interact with a Christless, continually more secularizing culture? It is to be good. It is to do good. As God's people, Paul is telling Titus to remind his Christ followers in Crete, and by definition us too, 
that how do we respond to increasingly rejecting and Christless culture? It is not with contempt, which I see a lot from Christians, contempt, but with love and generosity and goodness that draws people. Remember last week's sermon that draws people. Doesn't malign the word of God, but draws people into the gospel. So let's go ahead and jump into these, these four things. These, not four, these, yeah, four. Four reminders of how to live like Christ in a Christless, deplorable world. Instead of contempt and hatred and separation, look at these three things, these four things. Remember your calling, verse one and two, right? Remind, first word, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, and to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle towards everyone. That last, that last clause, gentle towards everyone. When I was looking at this, you know, the first thing is I, I was looking at this, this discussion about being under authorities and being obedient, doing what's good and being peaceable, and it's all about this civil life that we have. How do we interact with one another? How do we live life under the sun? And Paul's reminding us of our calling. Our calling is to be like Christ. You can write that down. Our calling is to be like Christ. We are to mimic or to imitate Jesus Christ. We are to be like Christ. And so when it says remind the people, right? Remind them of their calling. Remind them implied in this of what they were given in the gospel. Remind them that God has called them into fellowship with himself through his perfect son, Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Remind them that they were given courtesy by God. In another translation, it says the word courtesy. Remind them that God was courteous to them, and so we should extend that courtesy to other people. Now, how often do we hear that in our culture today? When I'm listening to podcasts each day, I don't hear people talking about being courteous and being gentle to each other. Why not? Where has the idea of civility gone? This last week, we had some local elections. A number of the things that I wanted to happen personally in those, in those politics did not. Some of my closest friends voted the opposite of me. Guess what? They're still some of my closest friends. They're oddballs, but I love them anyhow, right? No. Do I have all knowledge and wisdom on politics? No, and neither do they, right? And we both had done a lot of research, and we both had done a, a lot of exploring what we should want and why we would have our positions and all that, and at the end of the day, their side won, and that's okay. I may not be happy about it, but can we be civil with each other? Can we still break bread together? Yes. Can we go out and hang out together? Yes. Can we go shoot guns together? Yes. Can we, well, if those that do shoot guns, some of those guys don't do that, right? But can we do these things together, right? We can. God's given us courtesy of relationship with him through Jesus Christ. We need to extend courtesy to other people so that they find God's love. So that they find God's love, right? In verse 4, it describes that when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. It's talking about Jesus Christ coming incarnate in the flesh. When the kindness and love of God appeared. That's what Paul is anchoring his discussion in. If you're going to be good, you've got to understand your calling, which is God's kindness and his love has appeared to us. In verse 5, it saved us. Not because of righteous things we've done, but because of God's mercy. God extended courteousness to us. And we need to turn around. It's not something we did. We need to turn around and extend it to other people. We need to remember what our calling is. And so Paul's saying to Titus, remind the people. Remind them that they're followers of Christ and that their behavior and attitudes matter. Remind them, right? In the previous chapter, chapter 2, verses 5, 8, and 10, where it talked about remind people to live this way so that they don't malign the word of God. Remind people to live this way so that the word of God is not put down, so that God's name is not put down. Remind people to to live this way so that the gospel is attractive. Paul is saying, tell the people at Crete to live, to be ready to do whatever is good. But he has specifically named some things. Don't slander other people. One of the issues I was dealing with this week was, 
it was one big time Christian leader in the conservative community that I love and respect and I just saw him two years ago and with intentionality and deliberation he lacked tact and he lacked goodness I think maybe I'm wrong but he attacked another leader in the Christian community that's a woman well in our particular climate politically right now there's a little bit of suicideness to that right just a little bit of craziness but he, even if what he said was right and he has some points how he did it made it to where nobody's ready to listen do you understand so let's say he's right I listened to all his comments watched the video broke it apart dissected it with pastors and all that and across the board all the men that I sat with said he is wrong I can't believe it and then they started saying things like this. I'm not sure if I want to continue. Because, now this guy's got a powerful ministry. He does a wonderful thing. He may even be right, and I'll say he is on a few points. But how he did it was ungodly, not gentle, not loving, and lacked tact. The four-letter word that we need today doesn't begin with an F. It begins with a T, tact, T-A-C-T. We need tact in this culture. And how we deal with each other. And so we spent all this time talking about what is our response? What are we going to do with all these things? What did this guy do? And then other people were brought into the discussion, right? And Paul says, remind people of their calling. We get off track. Lots of things derail us from what our mission and purpose is. And we're going to look at that. So remember what your calling is. Your calling is be subject, right? Be obedient. Be ready to do what is good. Why does it say be subject to authorities and leaders and all that? Because people realize that if you're a good citizen, you're a good person, generally speaking. Don't slander. This guy was borderline slandering almost, almost. Be peaceable, be considerate, and be gentle towards everyone. And another part of the scriptures, it talks about for the man of God, the pastors, the elders, us for that, that when we're trying to correct someone, we should teach them with all truth and not, not go against that refute error but do it with gentleness and respect not become a quarrelsome person that's how we should interact with other people in our community so god is reminding us through titus 3 first of all that that we should remember what our calling is god gave goodness to us we need to give that to other people now now paul brings up another important question here what if the culture or the government tells you to be at odds to do something that's odds with scripture should we do that? The answer is no. In Acts chapter 4, I think it's verse 19, you see an answer from the apostles saying, you judge between yourselves whether we should obey God or we should obey men. As for us, we're going to obey God, basically, is the gist of it. So when you're put in a position where you have to choose between obeying some earthly authority in your household, the government or whatever else, or obeying God, you obey God first, right? Nobody's higher than Him. And so when we obey the government within what we can, that's not against the Word of God, we show ourselves to be good citizens. When we're not slanderous to our neighbors, we show ourselves to be good people. When we're peaceable, not quarreling and not fighting, we show ourselves to be good people. And when we do good works, when we're gentle towards people, when we're considerate, we show ourselves to be good. And Paul is telling Titus, remind the people, this is your calling to do good. That's why God saved you. That's the first reminder. Ready? First reminder, civility, to do good, to be about doing these businesses, right? We need to remember that our calling is to be bearers and carriers of the gospel of the good news. Amen? We both live the gospel and we speak the gospel. You got to have both. People want to just, I'm not very good, I'm an introvert, I don't want to speak. Too bad, the scriptures tell you to do so. Well, I'm an extrovert, I'm really good at speaking, but sometimes I have a hard time settling down and doing what it says. Too bad, the scriptures tell you to live the gospel too. We got to have both hands for people to get it. And in today's world where the gospel is not around in our secular culture, we need to extract that from both people. We need to reach out to them with the verbal and with our lifestyle to pull them into the gospel. They need all the help they can get to find Jesus Christ. And so the second thing, verse 3, remember 
your lostness, right? At one time, we too, talking about all of us believers, right? We're foolish. We were disobedient. We were deceived. That's by the devil, right? And enslaved all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Boy, that's strong language in today's world, right? Hating and being hated. Paul is saying that there's no doubt, right? There's no doubt that living among those who do not value or follow Jesus day in and day out, that it takes a toll on us. I think that's sometimes why Christians become contemptuous towards the culture and they separate out from the culture is because it takes a toll on you to interact with the culture. But God left us here for a reason, which is to give the gospel, to interact with the culture, to be salt and light. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you need to be salt and light. And if you lose your flavoring like salt that goes bad, you're no good for anything. He left us here. He saved us. He didn't rapture us. He didn't take us up right now because we're supposed to be here being salt and being light in our workplaces, in our community, in our places of commerce, in the marketplace, in our places of entertainment. We are to be salt and light. But I think sometimes... The day in and day out takes a toll on us. Life can be difficult. It's not easy living among people that are different than us, that go in a completely different direction from God. They have different goals. They have different priorities. And here's the thing. Big surprise. They don't have Jesus. They're going to live differently. Amen? We should not be surprised when sinners, like we were, Paul says, live as sinners because they don't have Jesus in their lives. So why are we surprised that they live that way? We shouldn't be surprised that they live that way. But Paul points us to this focus, that sometimes we get frustrated in dealing with a tough world that's against Jesus because we have forgotten, we have forgotten that we are broken, that we are the ones who need the gospel. We have forgotten, right? We become frustrated because we forget that the only reason that we're not stuck in sin like the rest of the world is because of the grace of of God, the grace of God. We were malicious. We were enslaved to passions and pleasures and all those things. And then he switches to verse 4. But then the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, and he saved us. He saved us from ourselves. He saved us from our sin. He saved us. And he, not because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy, and he saved us through washing us. He gave us spiritual rebirth and renewal in the Holy Spirit, right? God saved us, and we've got to remember to rehearse the gospel story of our lives. How did I come into the kingdom of God? What did God do to bring me into that? Did I do something to get there? No, I was lost in my lostness. I was lost in my lostness, and there's nothing I could do to pursue God, but God pursued me, as C.S. Lewis called it. He got, Jesus is the hound of heaven. That's on my blood trail, so to speak. And he's going to find a way. And I can tell you from my personal experience of walking away from Christ and Christ finding a way to bring me back into it that he is the hound of heaven. He'll do anything, anywhere, at any time to move us a step towards Jesus Christ and to be conformed into his image. Because it's the most important thing for your eternity. More important than all the other blessings that you want in this world. And so God wants us to remember through Paul to Titus to tell the people, remember that you were lost that you were just like them, right? Now I got a picture to kind of visualize this. Can you put that up, Melena? Last night, Carl was showing us some pictures of the young compadre, okay? And he put these two pictures side by side when they come up. And one is a picture of a tree growing out of a rock that's kind of all twisted and gnarled, right? And the other one is a picture of a tree that has grown up in that same area, huge and full. And that is a picture of what happens to us. When I was lost without Christ, I was that bent, twisted, gnarled up tree growing in hard soil of the rock, right? I don't know if we're going to be able to get it up. Are we going to be able to get it up? We'll see. But after Jesus Christ, I was this flourishing tree that grew and sprouted and became green and powerful, right? And when we remember that we were twisted and misshaped and, and hard, then we are more tender with people that are just like that now without Jesus Christ. Does that make some sense? When we remember, when we rehearse what we were like before the grace of God, it motivates us to be very tender, to be very caring, to be very considerate with other people who are sinners that still need Jesus. 
And when I say sinners, it's not a put down. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We're all sinners, right? We all need the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul has said, here we go. There's the first tree. Growing up all twisted and gnarled right out of the rock. That was us before Jesus, right? Take a good look. Because we were that bad. Some of us were much worse, including me. Now, show us the second one, Milena, please. That is what we're like after Jesus Christ. Big and strong and powerful, right? Like Psalms 1 talks about, that tree that grows up next to a stream of water. That stream of water is Jesus Christ. And so Paul is telling Titus to remind the, the Christ followers at Crete that, hey, you're getting upset with the world. You're, you're having these problems with the world. Don't forget to do good. Remember your calling, but also remember your lostness because it makes you more tender to people who are lost. Remember what you went through and how God got you there, and remember that God will bring other people that are broken. And isn't this what Jesus was like? He was broken and had compassion on those who were broken around him. One of the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross was, Father, what? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. When he was dying for us, when he was on the cross shedding his blood for us, in that moment, looking at people that were making fun, some of them that had beat him and stripped him and harmed him, some of the centurions and the soldiers, and they're making fun and they're, they're throwing jeers on him and they're saying, if you're the son of God, come down and save yourself. And these, these two thieves or whatever on the side are saying, yeah, man, if you're the guy, come on, save us all. And in the midst of all that, Jesus is praying for us. And if you've never done so, you ought to picture your face at the foot of the cross in the face of one of those people making fun of Jesus. Because if we were there, we would have been doing the same thing. In our lostness, without God, we would have been part of that crowd putting him down. But Jesus was praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so he had compassion. We looked at that through the book of Mark. And as we go into the book of Luke soon, we're going to be looking at his compassion. Luke is filled with with these stories like the Good Samaritan and other ones, right? The prodigal son, all these stories of God's compassion, his love, his mercy, his grace that has no end. And when we understand how it changed our lives, our lostness, then we're ready to do something with other people, right? Which brings us, and this is what it says, Colossians 1.13, For you rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the dominion of the Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so the third thing in verses 4 through 7 is to remember our salvation. When the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. Not because of good things, but because of His mercy. He saved us, He washed us, He renewed us by the Holy Spirit, and He poured out on us generously God's Spirit through the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, through Jesus Christ. And He justified us by His what? By His grace, verse 7 that we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. We forget those great words of John Newton that we once were lost, but now we're what? Found. Blind, but now we see. Amazing grace is timeless. It's timeless. It's great theology that never goes away. And, and when we forget about our lostness, we also forget about our salvation. When's the last time you thought about that moment or that time or that period of time, that experience of things changing for you when you went from being lost without Christ in your life to putting your faith and your trust completely in Jesus Christ alone to forgive you from your sins and to make you right with God. Do you remember that time? Do you remember that experience? Maybe it was in a snapshot in time for many people. For some people, it's a little bit longer. But do you remember that? And do you rehearse it? Because when you rehearse it, you're rehearsing the gospel applied to your life. You're rehearsing your own salvation. You're rehearsing and reminding yourself of what God did to reach you, up, to reach you right? Salvation from our sins. It says, was it due to us? No. Everything in Scripture tells us that we cannot earn our salvation. It's a free gift of God. Not because of righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy, right? Did we wash ourselves of our sin and guilt? No. God is the great washer of our souls. The Holy Spirit washed us and gave us a new life and a new birth. Were we justified by our goodness and good deeds? No. 
it says in verse 7, we were justified by His grace. And when we remember that everything that we have, that we enjoy, that we did not earn, but we received, as 1 Corinthians says, what do you have that you did not receive? When you rehearse that, your lostness and your salvation, then you're very motivated to be tender and accepting of other people that are lost and then to move out on their behalf to give them the same grace that you've had. I heard it said in a sermon one time that we are just beggars who've received alms going out and telling other beggars where to find bread. Isn't that a good metaphor? We're just beggars who've received alms telling other beggars, hey, if you go over here, that's where you're going to find bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who eats of me shall never hunger again. Right? Out of me shall come flows, streams of living water. And if you drink from me, he says to the woman at the well in John 4, you shall never thirst again. Right? All these things. Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah 55, he invites people in. He says, come and eat of me without payment, without cost. There's nothing you can do to earn it. Come and have fine wine and eat choice meat and good bread and milk and honey and all that stuff. And it's a picture of coming into God and taking from God spiritually. And there's nothing that you bring to the table. You don't bring your wallet. You don't bring your gold. You got nothing to offer, folks. And neither do I. We cannot earn our way into heaven. So remind people of their calling. Remind people of their lostness. And remind people of their salvation, right? As we rehearse, as we remember those things, we're ready to engage our culture instead of with contempt or with tiredness or with worn outness, or with being emotionally depleted, we're ready to engage our culture with a heart that says, I want you to have what I have. That's the greatest thing that you have in your story, is to tell people what God's done for you. This is what I was like before. This was my experience of change with Jesus Christ, and He's the one that did that. And this is what my life is like afterwards. It may not be profound, but guess what? The person you're talking to may not need profound, probably doesn't. They need a normal, ordinary person with skin on them that lives a life like them, tough under the sun, to give them a little bit of grace of something that they need, right? Remind them of these things. And finally, Paul says in verses 8 through 15, to remember, remind the people of their mission. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things, right? So that those who have trusted in God, that's us, the believers, may be careful to devote themselves to what? To doing what is good. That's the major theme. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. And then he gives us a warning, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, arguments, and quarrels because they're unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time and then have nothing to do with them. You can be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They're self-condemned. And so this whole piece here that Paul's putting together is this idea to remind people, right, of their mission. The Cretan church, the Cretan Christians, the Christ followers there had gotten off the rails. How many times, think about your own life, as you've been going along living life as a believer, have you gotten off the rails? You got off point, right? You got off message, and God has to bring you back around, and he reminds you of that. Well, the, the Christ followers in Crete had done that. They'd gotten off message, and he says, remind them to do what their mission is. Their mission is to do good. And what is good? It is to be living out the gospel. It is to glorify God. That is what we're supposed to do. That is our purpose, is to live out and speak out the gospel on one side and to glorify, right? The scriptures are very clear about that. And whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him, right? Glorify God. We are to glorify God and we're to give the gospel. We are to do good. And when we're doing good, people say, why are you doing good? Why are you doing this in Christ's name? Is it okay to say that? I'm doing this because Jesus loved me, so I'm loving you. That's okay to say that. In fact, that's a good thing to say that. People have often asked me, why are you doing this? I don't understand. What is your motive? Right? Because you grew up in a harsh world and you realize that people have mixed motives. And they're always... What, what's the angle? One guy asked me one time, what is your angle? I said, well, this is my angle, and my angle is the cross of Jesus Christ. I needed Jesus bad. 
bad, bad, bad. And if I didn't have Jesus at this point in my life, I'd be dead or I'd be a really, really, really rotten guy. Period. End of sentence. Because my pride, because my anger, because my lust, whatever you want to put in there. And so my angle is I desperately needed the gospel, and you do too. That's my angle. What's your motive? My motive is Jesus in his courtesy gave me love, and I'm just extending it out to you. That's my, that's my motive. I want you to have what is the answer to life. I want you to have what other people have. I just want you to have Jesus. I want good for you. I want you to have good. That's a big deal in our world because most of our world is spending time putting themselves out front. Most of our world is spending time trying to get what's best for them, right? I had one young lady, when I was talking to her counselor one time, she said, I'm doing what I have to do right now to get the best for me, the most for me, for as long as I'm still here. I said, that's a hard life, girl. She said, I probably won't be around in 10 years. Her lifestyle, drugs, gangs, violence, sexual promiscuity, it's probably true. Do you want to live that way? Well, that's all I got. What if there's another way? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. That's all there is. That's the world has to offer. So I'm getting as much as I can, as fast as I can, as quick as I can, drink it all in before it's done. What if there's another way? Would you be interested? Yeah, maybe. You share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel has applicability to everybody. Our mission is to give the gospel, to live the gospel, and to glorify God. To give the gospel, to live the gospel, and to glorify God. And if we're doing those things, we are doing good works. Now, why the specific warning by Paul about people that are quarrelsome, that are divisive, that are doing these different things, right? They have controversies and genealogies, and they're arguing and they're quarreling about all these things. Why this discussion? Because it was killing the church. Have you and I ever experienced time in a church when churches were fighting and dividing over stupid stuff? Forgive me for saying stupid, but let's be real. Stupid stuff. Stupid stuff. Stupid stuff. Let's major on the main things and let's forget about the minor things. Let's debate the peripheral things, but let's major on the major things, right? Let's stick with the core things. The doctrine of God, the doctrine of Scripture. You want to know what the main things are that we have to quarrel over, that we have to divide over? The doctrine of Scripture, that it's inerrant, that it's absolutely trustworthy, that it has, it's infallible, that it is the Word of God perfect in every shape and form. Something we cannot, we cannot go along with a difference on. We have to hold to that, right? Because the Scripture says so, and we build our lives on it. The deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. When someone starts to, to cut one of those off, they usually end up being a cult. You ever notice that? They change the humanity or the deity of Christ or the word of God, one of those three things. And they usually end up being a cult. So we gotta fight for those things because that's God himself, his humanity, his deity. And his finished work on the cross, right? If you wanna add, it's Jesus plus nothing. So if you add something else to it, that's something that we got to have a fight over, right? And I don't mean physically, but I mean we got to have a discussion over. Those are things that we hold to, the big, huge, strong things, the doctrine of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God being all-knowing and all-loving and all-good and, and all those things. Th those are things that we have to hold on to. But, folks, we divide over all kinds of ridiculous stuff. Does it really matter what you wear to church? Good grief, you got to be kidding me. My previous church, I wore a suit, head to toe, deck to the hilt, required to, that's what you did. I'm not wearing that now. In fact, when I first came here, you, a couple of you said, hey, if you wear a suit, that ain't going to fly here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Freedom. Freedom. Suits are expensive, and I cook. I would just pour down sweat. You know how I get hot. Man, just kill me, right? But there may be a setting a funeral, a wedding, something special where you wear a suit, right? But we divide over stupid stuff like that. We divide over what translation of the scriptures you're reading. 
Well, if it's one of the major translations, the NIV, the ESV, the NASB, New King James, King James, those are all good. Why are we dividing over that? They're all English translations of the Hebrew and the Greek, right? Most people don't understand those languages anyhow. So all those are good. Why do, why do we divide over all kinds of crazy things about baptism, about all kinds of stuff? We divide over all kinds of stuff. And those are important things. They're important things. I'm not minimizing them. We need to follow what the Scripture says and do what the Scripture says. But I can work alongside a brother or sister that has a difference of opinion on tongues or has a difference of opinion on this, that, or the other. We walk side by side, shoulder to shoulder, to put the gospel into the world. We don't divide over those things. We don't kill each other. We don't shoot each other, right? Over stupid stuff. You don't do that. We should be aligned together. And so Paul is saying, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about these things. They're unprofitable. They're useless. Let those things go. Don't kill each other over those things. Remind the people of their calling, who they are, what their purpose is, right? To be graceful people. Remind them of their lostness because it makes us tender of other people that are lost. Remind them of their salvation so we know what to give to other people, the grace of Jesus Christ. And then remind them, okay? Remind them at the end here. Remind them to do good. Remind them of their mission, which is the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, ponte ethne, of all people groups, of all ethnic groups is its little translation. Go and make disciples of all people groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that God commanded. That is your mission and mine. We don't need to just know our calling and remember our lostness and salvation. We need to remember what our mission is. The reason I'm still around for a few more years is because I'm supposed to be giving the gospel of Jesus Christ and making disciples, and you are too, amen? A farmer makes disciples. A rancher makes disciples. A businessman makes disciples. A lawyer makes disciples. A policeman can make disciples. God has you in your spheres, in your vocations, in your families, where you live geographically, so that you are salt and light where you're supposed to be. And your mission is to go and make disciples. My neighbors should be my prime targets on both sides of my house for discipleship. My neighbor across the street, right, should be prime targets for discipleship. The children in my home, they better be disciples, right? They're my primary first people, my wife and my kids, making disciples, making sure they follow Christ. The people that I interact with in church, obviously in my line of work, make disciples, but also out at a football game, also out hunting, also out four-wheeling. The gospel should be a part of everything that we do. Can you go dirt biking and have the gospel part of that? Yes, goodness gracious. My neighbor across the street's a big motorbiker. If I want to talk about the gospel, I better be talking about motorbiking. That's what he lives for. So I got to find out something about motorbiking that I can relate to and do and be a part of and use that as a platform for the gospel because that's what he's into. That's what he lives for. That's what he eats, breathes, and sleeps is motorbikes. So the gospel better find a way through that avenue, right? That's the fun of it. Is that we, we can figure out how to use people's interests to give them Jesus Christ. That's our mission. And so at the end of this, don't be divided. Don't be distracted. That's the big message here. Paul's saying, don't be divided within the church. Don't be distracted. Stay on mission. Remember your calling. Remember your lostness. Remember your salvation. And remember your mission. Put all those things together and do good. Do good in the community. Do good. After he's telling all these corrections to the church, he's saying, turn around and be ready to do whatever is good. Verse 1. And then down below, right? He, verse 8. Be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. All these things are profitable and they're excellent. And then he keeps using that kind of discussion, that kind of discussion of goodness. Because ultimately, God is good. All good emanates from Him, and all good is from Him. So if we're doing good, we're giving the gospel. If we're doing good, we're giving the gospel. Right? Everything that we do for good can be those things for the gospel. 
devote yourselves. Verse 14, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and to live not unproductive lives. Unproductive for the gospel, for the kingdom of God. Not unproductive on this earth. Unproductive for the heavenly realm. Spurgeon used a powerful metaphor that I mentioned, I think, last week or the week before. That every time we pray, every time we share the gospel, every time we move somebody just a tiny bit towards Jesus, we start putting Jesus into things. That we're about the business of reaching down into hell and snatching people out of the flames. We are in the business of being firefighters, of reaching down into hell and snatching people out of the flames of eternal loss. It should matter to me that my Colorado State Patrol neighbor knows or does not know Jesus Christ. I love him and his wife. They're good people. It should matter to me whether they know Jesus or not. It should matter to me that the neighbor across the way that's a wonderful guy that knows fine wine and is cultured, likes to ride motorcycles, that he and his wonderful wife who works at the hospital as a respiratory therapist, it should matter to me whether they know Jesus Christ or not. It should matter to me whether the gal across the street that has her own home business, doing t-shirts, that has been in this church, whose kids are in baseball, you know, blah, 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 that she knows Jesus Christ. It should matter to me that if Jesus Christ returns tomorrow, that not only am I on the train to go, but they're part of it too. It should matter. If I only care about my own kids and my own family, woe is me. I'm a pitiful man. It should matter. It should matter. And so Paul is saying to Titus, remind the Cretan believers of their calling, of their lostness, of their salvation, of their mission, which is to go forth in the gospel and to glorify God. Our tendency as the people of God is to drift off mission. And so Paul ends his time by saying, Remember these good guys, Tychicus, and remember this guy, da 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 and remember Zemus, the lawyer, all these people that have stayed on mission. Remember them. They're good examples to you. Remember them. We need to stay on mission and not have mission drift. As we close out 2019 and move into 2020, we're moving into a new decade. Calvary Baptist needs to be ready for the new decade. One of the ways we're going to get ready is we're going to preaching of the gospel. We're going to preach through the book of Luke. The gospels do more for me when I preach to them than for anything else. I don't really know why. It's all the word of God, but the gospels when I preach through Mark is powerful. And people talk about that we need to get back to the life of Jesus Christ. We need to get back to the teachings of Jesus Christ, and we need to do it. We just simply need to live it. Let God's spirit empower us. We don't have to do it in our own flesh. Let God's spirit empower us to do those things, to do good. We need to be ready, right? I don't know about you, but when I watch things and when I discuss things and listen to things, our culture is changing rapidly. This isn't a poo-poo on our culture. I love American exceptionalism. I love American. I do. We've been a great nation that's given salt and light to the world all over the place. But we're on a rapid slide, and that's just pretty clear to see by anybody who watches. And I follow a lot of cultural things. Not only as a culture, but individually. This week, people that I knew peripherally on the edges passed from this life to the next. And the interesting about it is most of them were young. Most of them were young. We recently had an accident here locally last night involving a few members of our high school and former members. Okay? We need to be in prayer for them and their families. Life is tenuous. Life is not a guarantee. Life is not certain. The young man that I knew that was in Afghanistan that died, he was a combat medic. Six years of combat experience, right? Six years. Things happen. It's not always even combat related. You just don't know. Why am I saying these things? Paul is reminding Titus to remind the Cretan believers Make the main things the plain things. Stick with the gospel and glorifying God. Stay on the rails and see to it that other people join us in the kingdom of God. That's a pretty simple message. I think that's a great message for us at Calvary Baptist. 
When we do Operation Christmas Child, that's about getting kids onto the train to heaven. Amen? That guy from Burino Faso or whatever the name, I can't say the name of the country, but that wonderful African man speaking about his experience, he became a disciple, and then he became a disciple maker, right? That's why we do Operation Christmas Child. It's not because I like loading boxes. No. It's because I care about the kid on the other side that's going to get the gospel and come into the kingdom of God. It's why we do what we do. It's why we're about this business. We need to get back to being about the basics, people. I think the book of Luke is going to help us with that, right? The beginning of the book of Luke is we look at Christmas time and Jesus Christ and all those things. And as we move into next year, the life of Christ, Christ was very focused. He was very deliberate. He was compassionate. He was loving. He was caring. 